Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to a presentation on solar panels uh, for your boat. I'm Jeff Cote uh, with Pacific Yacht Systems, and I thank all of you for being here with me, sharing a little bit of my passion about marine electrical and trying to stay at anchor for longer or do more of the things we want to be doing. And solar is one of those things that allow us to get there, right? So a little bit uh, about myself. I'm intrinsically, I think, who I am as a person is a bo boater. I've actually given thought to what I would have on my tombstone. And I was like, what would describe me more than anything? And it's one word, a boater. And all, th all the things that are part of that. So um, as an engineer, I always knew that I wanted a boat. I was about four years old when I started visualizing boating. And I clearly remember those days. And uh, once, as soon as I finished university, headed west and came to the coast and started boating. And what I realized uh, shortly after buying our first boat, which was April Fool's Day in 2006, was that power was going to be a real issue on our boat. Water was doable, but power was going to be a big issue. How was I going to be able to stay at anchors for an extended period of time and do all the things that I want to do, which was run a refrigerator, and we'll talk about that. But ultimately, I wanted to be able to run a refrigerator, have some lights on at the very least, and not have to run my main engine at idle to recharge my batteries. And so that was sort of the genesis. Um, that actually brought me not only a now as a boater, but as someone who now wants to solve problems, thinking there's got to be a way to resolve this power problem on our boats. So this quest led me to start my business, which I'm going to talk a little bit about. And if you're curious about geeking out, I use that term as a way to say, I want to make my boating experience better. What are the tools out there that I can make boating better for myself? Uh, we've been writing two columns every month uh, at Pacific Yachting for almost 10 years now, I think nine years, and about a year with Northwest Yachting. And if you're not a subscriber to those magazines, the good news is you can find every single one of the articles that we've written on all the topics on our website. Everything is there in a PDF or HTML format, so you can see it as a web page, or you can download a PDF and it's going to look exactly like the magazine. So that's a way for you as a boater to sort of Maybe you know five years ago you weren't interested in solar, and now you want to read the four or five articles that I wrote over the last 10 years on solar, and you want to print them out and educate yourself on how you're going to make a decision about that. Uh, website is uh, pysystems.ca, Pacific Yacht Systems, so pysystems.ca. And I'm going to show you a link at the end about that as well on the last slide. Another good news is all of these slides are actually going to be posted on our website. Sharing is caring. You know, honestly, what makes boating, I think, so attractive to many of us is the community aspect. You know, boaters help each other out. I mean, it's part of it. If you don't like other people, you're probably not going to find it too friendly to have all these people offering a hand. Offering a hand when we're docking. Offer a hand when you have, you're stuck. Your engine won't start. Offering a hand, I remember we were stuck one year in a place and somebody rode over and said, you know, we've been here for seven days fighting the storm. Are you okay? Do you need any food? That community is beautiful. And as part of a boater, myself, I think what we do, what we learn working on every one of our boats, I simply return and give back to all of you here in the room, and we all do the same. The company that I founded is called Pacific Yacht Systems. We're just north uh, in Vancouver. And um, we get invited, and I take that as a huge honor, on about 1,000 boats a year. Um, clearly, I don't do the work or get it done. Uh, the team around me actually gets to get to work on people's boat and accomplish the dreams that we set forth together. Uh, but that experience is what I'm going to be sharing with you today, uh, specifically to solar panels. And the other thing, too, is if you rather watch videos than reading, uh, we have a really big presence on YouTube. We're at about now 165 videos of varying lengths. People seem to be resonating. It's a way in the evening, you may be tired of watching the normal TV and you want, again, you're interested in a specific topic, and you're like, I want, I'm curious about alternators, batteries, solar. Anything related to electrical or electronics is our specialty, and we're publishing content all the time, sharing what we learn on working on our boats. Uh, we're gonna start the big stage. I mean, what, what are we looking at here? Um, let's understand that solar is, is just one way of recharging our batteries, right? 
On a boat, uh, there's going to be multiple ways of recharging boat batteries. Pretty commonly, uh, everyone's got an engine, pretty much. And if you've got an engine, you have an alternator. And an alternator is one way to recharge your batteries. But that means the engine has to be running. And generally at idle, an engine doesn't output a lot of, out of power. So it means that you need to rev up. And a lot of us, maybe trawlers or sailboaters, are not revving up as high as we want to save fuel. right? And so our alternators are not outputting what we want. And the other challenge that we have here in the Pacific Northwest is once you're cruising, Let's think about it. The distances between an amazing anchorage to another amazing anchorage is not measured in days and weeks. It's two hours, three hours, 15 nautical miles, 10 nautical miles, 25 nautical miles. But once you're in a place in the Gulf Islands or Desolation Sound or the Browns or even the outside of Vancouver Island, the distances you cover are not all that great. And we can stay at anchorages for two, three, four days. How do you recharge your batteries if you're not running your engine? And that's what we're going to be talking about solar. The other thing, too, is people end up, most of us will have what's called a battery charger on board, right? A battery charger is a device that if it has AC, which is shore power, or an AC generator running, can convert that AC source, shore power, or generator, and convert it to DC. But not all of us in the room are going to have a generator. So what happens when you're not connected to the dock? Or what if your boat in the summertime is on a mooring ball in front of maybe a cottage or near a you know, recreational property that you have. And you're not even plugged in. So a charger is really of no benefit for a boater if you can't connect to shore power. The other thing too is I have owners that really didn't use a generator for anything else than recharging the batteries. And the generator over time was giving them grief. You know, not all gener generators are running flawlessly and without any grief. And I can't tell you the number of boats where we've taken out a generator that really didn't see any use other than recharging batteries and was giving a lot of grief to the owner. I've done that on a bunch of Grand Banks, a bunch of sailboats, 50-footer. They're like, that's it. I'm done with the generator. I don't like the noise. Let's take it out. Here's all this sudden space I have for something else. And let's put solar panels as an alternative because realistically, if I can get away with the sun doing what the generator used to do, why not? And lastly, another common way of recharging batteries is you see that a lot more, not so much in the Pacific Northwest, but in the Caribbean and cruising areas or in the South Pacific, uh, wind turbines, right? Here in the Pacific Northwest, the challenge is our anchorages are so bulletproof or hurricane holes that the wind needs to be really blowing hard for it to blow hard in an anchorage, right? The trees are giants. I mean, you know, for it to blow 30 knots or 20 knots in an anchorage in the Pacific Northwest, it's pretty uncommon. So in the summer when things are rather mild, you're not going to have a chance to use your wind generator as often here in the Pacific Northwest. Definitely arguments in the Caribbean, for sure. Here in the Pacific Northwest, a little harder. Um, so what we're going to be looking at next is we're going to be talking about specifically solar and solar controllers. Okay, let's, let's not forget that you absolutely need a device in between a solar panel and the batteries to regulate the sun's power because your batteries might be full, right? It's like uh, going somewhere and there's a buffet. You know, at the end of the day, you're only going to eat if you're hungry. You can be maybe say, hey, you know what, I'm going to eat a lot because I'm anticipating. But if there's endless food in front of you, at one point you're going to say, I can't no more. Right? You got to stop. And so what the regulator does is says, you know, I know there's a lot of sun out there. Yeah, I could use that sun and recharge the batteries, but the batteries don't need it. So that's what the role of a solar controller is. It regulates the voltage and decides through a smart charging curve, right, bulk absorption float. And it's going to say, you know what, at this point, we'll just sort of float the batteries, but we don't need to overcharge the batteries. So that's really important. So. When boaters come to me and say, Jeff, you know, tell me what, what can solar do for me? Why would I consider solar? Generally, I'd say one of the number one reasons is, Jeff, I want to stay an anchor an extra day. You know, I'm at an anchor now for two days or a day. Give me another day at anchor or give me another two days at anchor. Um, the other one that's really common, I have boaters that say, Jeff, I remember the day when I didn't have a refrigerator on board. On board. And I know that my refrigerator takes a lot of power, offset my loads related to the refrigerator. 
Or I am doing big power boats now where they're saying, I have a generator, I plan on keeping it, but I don't want to run my generator or recharge my batteries as often. Put a huge solar array, I'm doing that right now on a 65 North oven. We're doing a 1800 watt array. The owner has two generators on board, two. But we're doing an 18100 away array as a way to reduce the generator runtime, right? The owner would rather not run the generator to recharge the batteries. They'll run their generator, make water through a water maker, to run maybe the stove top, right? Run large AC loads on board, but not to recharge the batteries. Here's another big, and this is where comparing our notes here from the Pacific Northwest with other boaters in the Caribbean or elsewhere doesn't tell you the whole picture. In the Pacific Northwest, in the summer months, we have very long days. The sun rises quite early and goes and well, goes to sleep, you know, over the horizon or sets very late. What that means is that we have 15 hours of sunshine in the summer, you know, in June, July, parts of August, parts of May. And that what that means is that your solar panel will give you better output not at any given moment, but because the day is longer, if you work more hours, you're just simply going to have more income. And that's where, there's a question up front, I'll, just one second, that's where this is a big differentiator in the Pacific Northwest, that we're going to get more from our solar panels in the summer. Now, the converse is also true. In the wintertime, when it is the end of the world, and it, the days are only eight hours, and the sun is low on the horizon, and it's raining nonstop, your solar panels are doing the very opposite. So you win on some days, and you lose on other days. You win in the summer, you lose in the winter. The good news is most of us are not boating in the winter, and most of us are boating in the summer. Question up front. I was wondering how to do an overcast. Yeah, so the question up front was how do solar panels do on overcast? Overcast, it really depends. What's overcast? You know, there's some days where, you know, the thickness of the cloud of the overcast is so dark, it feels like Armageddon. And some other days, you see it's overcast, you can't see the sun. For example, on those smoky days where we had some huge forest fires, you know, those days don't, the smoke is there, but it's not thick, it's just blankets everything. So you're still getting good solar output, you're not seeing the sun, but the sun's going through. The thicker the clouds, the darker it is, that's when you lose solar output. Like on a day like now, it, you know, you're getting, because also the sun where it is on the horizon, you're gonna get only maybe 10, 15% of output on a day like today. But in the summer when it's cloudy, but the skies are really high and it's still bright outside, you're gonna get maybe two thirds of the output. It's not a black and white, it's not on or off. Another consideration is, and I hear this quite often from a lot of boaters when we're doing boat shows or presentations is, oh Jeff, flexible, flexible solar panels don't give uh, the same sort of output as rigid. That's why I'm not gonna do flexible. Those days are gone. Nowadays, if you buy a 100 watt solar panel, rigid or flexible, they're gonna be the same size. The difference is you're gonna pay a lot more for a flexible than a rigid. That the difference is in cost. It's not a factor of, and I remember another question, they're like, oh well, my rigid 100 is way better than my rigid flexible. I'm like, no, 100 watt is 100 watt, right? It's apples to apples. The difference is if you buy a mono or a poly, and we'll talk about that later, then there's difference in sizes and pricing, but a 100 watt solar panel is a 100 watt solar panel, regardless if it's poly, mono, rigid, or flexible, okay? One of the considerations and advantages with flexible solar panels is they're so lightweight. Meaning, as we bring weight more aloft on a boat, that underway in following seas when the boat is pitching and yawing can make the ride less comfortable. So there are concerns of putting heavy solar panels off a solar arch 12 feet on a sailboat off the waterline. Right? That's why racers try to avoid having a, ma a radar on top of a mass above, let's say for example, the steaming light, because again, when the boat is on its side, it keeps going more on its side. So rigid solar panels versus flexible is you know, easily a factor of five to a factor of 10 in weight. You can buy a 100 watt solar panel, 170 watt solar panel is like five pounds. It's pretty much weightless. And what that means is you can take that weightless solar panel and you can start mounting it on your biminis, right? You can put it on your canvas because easily you can't start putting 
I don't know, three 200 watt solar panels on your existing Bimini and just hope that the canvas maker was expecting that you'd be putting in another 200 pounds of solar panels on that Bimini structure. But if it's flexible, it's only another 15 pounds. So it makes the decision of putting huge solar arrays on large Biminis easy because they're practically weightless. You'll see when you're walking through the show or you see other boats, there's multiple ways of mounting these solar panels on your canvas. On my boat, um, and that's the picture of my boat right there, uh, I use zippers on all four sides. Uh, there's some people that are actually bolting them through, literally putting a nut in a washer. You'll see that Iverson down below. Um, there's people that use Velcro. There's people that use snaps. Uh, I've seen owners that take bungee, take it on and off. There is a wide selection of choices on how you go about mounting a flexible solar panel onto canvas. Um, I'm not going to, offline, if you're curious about pros and cons, I have an opinion. But again, you know what? That's to the owner of the boat to decide what's the best way of doing it on their boat. You can see that in the picture, flexible solar panels are wafer thin. I mean, they're less than a thickness than a quarter. They're more like maybe a nickel in thickness, a little bit more than a dime. They're thin. They're very, very thin. So the other thing that they do is they can actually follow a curve. And I have to say, when we started doing solar panels about 10 years ago, I would have never thought that more than half of our market would be power boaters. Because in the past, most power boaters, would, it'd be pretty rare to see a power boat with rigid solar panels. And ultimately what it does is it changes the line of your boat. As a boater, you have to ask yourself, and that's what most boats, they're curves. It's all curves. There's very few straight lines on boats. You know, mass is an exception, a boom, yes. But after that, on a power boat, think about it, everything is just curves. There's very few straight lines. And the beauty of a solar panel, and I get this a lot from power boaters and sailors, is they say, Jeff, I don't want the look of my boat to be any different. I love the way she looks. I love the profile of the boat. And if you can give me solar but keep the look of the boat the same, I'm interested in talking. I don't want it to look too functional. I want it to be functional, but I don't want to look functional. I want it to be aesthetic, and I still want to have the gains. And that's one of the considerations with flexible, and that's why, for example, that Northhaven owner is covering all his awning on a 65, and he literally told me, he says, my partner does not want to see solar. She doesn't want to see it. If we can put it on and it looks pretty, I'm good with it. But we love the look of our boat. Make sure that the flexible solar panels just blend in. The other thing, too, that we end up doing is you can actually buy these solar panels with peel and stick adhesive. And you can actually literally, without doing any deck penetrations, which is a concern or should be a concern to all of us, literally peel and stick the solar panels onto hardtops. So I'm doing sea rays that have, you know, sea rays uh, flybridge that have these huge hardtops. I did a 560. We covered the whole roof with solar panels. Again, easy, no holes. We're not worrying about any sort of uh, water intrusion. And the profile of the boat looks the same. So you can actually peel and stick. And we even did a lagoon, a 50, huge 56 lagoon. The whole brow on the front. Like we literally put 1,000 watts of solar panel on the brow. Nobody could really step there. It was sort of angled. You wouldn't go there. And we actually peeled and stick all these solar panels right on the brow. A question up front. Yeah, what about the relative lifespan of the flexible panel versus the hard panel? The question uh, from the gentleman up front is, what about the relative lifespan of solar panels, flexible versus uh, rigid? Um, in my experience, uh, on my boat, I have Solbian solar panels now for eight years. My output is still quantified. I measure it every day. Like, I'm a geek. I'm an engineer. So I sort of need to justify all the money that I spend to someone else. So I have the proof right there. My solar panels are still doing exactly what they were eight years ago. The one thing to consider if the solar panel was well built, and, and that's a question like anything, the solar panel, everything is basically almost, it's enveloped in epoxy. Like there is no place to access that panel. Like it is literally covered in epoxy. So 
there is no weather damage that can happen to that solar panel. If the solar panel was well built at the beginning, five years down the road or 10 years down the road, it's still going to be well built. The problem is uh, some boaters are tempted by lowest price and they're thinking they're getting a deal. And I, I, you know, I get it. As a boater, we all want a deal. Of course we do. The problem is not so much what you pay is what you're going to get out over time. And that's where then on the cheap end of the spectrum, the feel good purchase, the one that wasn't hard to do, but it's probably two years. You'll see a lot of yellowing of the epoxy because it's not meant like the really good ones have a 20 year life. The budget ones are going lowest cost possible. They're thinking it needs to look good today, but tomorrow is someone else's problem, right? Some solar panels are offering five years warranty, full replacement. The other really interesting thing, and I think it's worth remembering, is that when you consider solar panels, especially if you're not just looking at the budget selection, which is worth considering, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, you make a choice. But in the end, what's interesting about a company like Gioco or Solbian or Solera, and there's a lot of different companies out there, is all the permutations of sizes. The challenge as a boater is we're not putting solar panels on a roof where it's an open canvas, right? Where you have endless choice to put the solar panels, you've got no constraints, no windows, no backstays, no hatches, you've got endless space. That's easy. You could just say, I'm gonna buy a bunch of hundreds, 100 watts, and I'm just gonna stack them. On a boat, you have a lot of constraints. Things are in the way. And so what we end up doing is we'll have, let's say in our shop, we have about 30 different solar panel sizes. And what you're doing is you're playing a little bit of a game of Tetris. You're trying to say, I want, like I had an owner last week said to me, he has a catamaran. I want 800 watts of solar panel. But then the game is, how do we get 800 watts of solar panel on the space that he has available, right? It's not like, oh, I just choose a panel and make it work. You know, the panels might be a little bit too long, a little bit too short. So a little bit too short, but then we missed two feet that we could have gotten. So what we end up doing is playing with these different sort of permutations. Um, on our website, um, if you're curious, there's all these different dimensions. There's multiple vendors out there that sell solar panels. That's up to you, but educate yourself that there's a lot of choice to maximize your solar array if you choose that's important for you, okay? Now, we also do boats with rigid, no doubt. You know, uh, for example, if you're a, power, a sailboater and you already have a uh, nice solar arch on your boat, right? It's already there, it's built, or call it a radar arch, and you've got space. Like for example, think about catamaran owners that have a, at the back they have sort of a dinghy davit, huge area where we can mount rigid solar panels, right? It's right there, it's sort of overhanging in the back, we're not gonna do flexible. We're gonna put a bunch of 300 watts. Um, we did, we are also in the RV market. I had a, a boater, well not a boater, an RVer from Arizona brought his RV to us and we ended up literally doing a bunch of 330s. Literally put four or five of them on top of the RV, the hard top, right? Right over. So it depends if you have a space to mount those rigid solar panels and if you can handle the weight. So those are the considerations. Because if you don't have a, a radar arch on your boat, let's say a sailboat, that is not a low cost item. That is not a $100, $1,000 line item. Depending on the shop that you're gonna get, and if you get it built in stainless, I mean, these, that's a, it's a big boat unit. It's not a small boat unit. Small boat unit being $1,000, it's a big boat unit. Okay, so that's something else to consider. Does it make sense? Am I comfortable? We're doing right now at Pacific Seacraft, uh, that's in the Carolinas at the factory. They're going with an arch, but it's a choice. It's, it's, you've got to decide the pros and cons. You're certainly going to spend way less per watt on a rigid solar panel than you will on a flexible. Quality to quality, if you buy you know, the best quality on rigid, the best quality on flexible, it's going to be a huge ratio in terms of price. Huge ratio, okay? You could be at least three times, four times more expensive for a uh, flexible. Yes, question in the back? In terms of the sail drag, like you're talking about putting panels on the cap roof, which is more tolerant of having sail material over the top of it intermittently? Yeah, that's a good question. The question in the back uh, was if I've got, you're putting solar panels, let's say on top of a Dodger, and we have a sailboat, and the sails are gonna drag on top, 
of the solar panels. Is it better to do rigid or flexible? I would probably say rigid. Rigid is glass. Flexible is epoxy, right? It's sort of a concoction. I think that's going to scratch easier than glass. On my boat, for example, I have never used a brush on my solar panels ever, ever. Because the moment it's sort of like brushing a pan, a non-skid pan, the moment you use that brush on the non-skid pan, you're going to be brushing that non-skid pan all the time. I just simply use water and a hose to wash off the debris, if there's any. Like we'll have a lot of pollen in the summer, for example, or dust. When the forest fires were around, there's a lot literally of ash. I'm just simply going to wash it down. I have never brushed my solar panels once. But also nothing sticks to it because I want it to be perfectly smooth. Again, example of rigid solar panels, there's so much choice um, with rigid tons. The problem is on the budget for flexible, very little choice. If you're not budget, then you can start having a lot of permutations. So again, to repeat, I sometimes have boaters that say to me, I really am cost conscious. I really wanted the lowest price solar panel option for me. I'm like, okay, we're going to look for budget solar panels. But then they're like, oh, I also want a 400 water ray. And then you look at the space configuration that they have on their boat, and it cannot be done. It just cannot be done. And then the owner, by default, says, I still want 400. I didn't want to spend money. Now I'm not spending money because I just don't care. I just have to. If I want 400 watt, it's the only way of doing it is with different size dimensions, a narrower, skinnier, longer, more rectangular. So you'll have more permutations on the higher end solar panels. Another question from the gentleman up front. If you're worried about brushing, or if you're avoiding brushing, uh, are you also trying to avoid walking on these things? No. The question is, are you, if you're avoiding brushing solar panels, can you, are you avoiding walking on them? Now, a flexible solar panel in the name says non-rigid, right? It means it's not a bridge, OK? A flexible solar panel will not span a distance with a hole underneath and provide any rigidity. It's not a bridge. That means if you have solar panels that are flexible, you need a perfectly smooth deck beneath. Perfectly smooth. That doesn't mean anti-skid, because the dimples between anti-skid are maybe, yeah, I don't know, in inches, maybe 1 16th. I'm thinking in mils. They're maybe 4 mils, 3 mils. That is a bridge, because a solar panel is the thinness, the wires are the thinness of a human hair. It's not a bridge. So when we mount them and we're going to walk on them, for example, that catamaran, we actually ended up smoothing all that anti-skid away, right? So that the solar panel was perfectly, perfectly smooth. Not, not the panel, what's underneath, and then you can walk on it because the solar panel is not acting as a bridge. It's not filling any gaps. Now, not all solar panels can be walked on. You have to buy a solar panel that says it can. And again, you'll spend more money with those panels, okay? You just got to do your homework. Ask the right questions like this gentleman did here, right? Look for it, say, you know what? I have owners sometimes that have solar panels. I had an owner says, sometimes my daughters are going on top of the roof to jump off the boat, and I want them to be able to walk. I'm like, it's going to be slippery. He's like, yeah, yeah, that's fine, but can they walk on the solar panel? I'm like, yeah, yeah, but it's going to be slippery. He's like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, I'm warning you, it's slippery. <laughs> He's like, yeah, yeah. OK, well, then, then that's three times. <laughs> We're good. I mean, it's just your daughters. No big deal. What, what's the worst that could happen? But what you want to do is you actually want to have a smooth surface, OK? Smooth surface below. So the next big dilemma as a boater, when you're looking at solar panels, you're saying, OK, Jeff, I'm hearing this term monocrystalline all the time, and I'm hearing polycrystalline all the time. What's the big difference? Ultimately, it comes down to efficiency, meaning a monocrystalline panel is going to give you more power for any given size. So for example, if you looked at the back of this laptop, let's say, and you said, I've got a, this area here. If it was 100 watts of, well, this would probably be 10 watts of solar panel. It'd be 10 watts with mono, and this exact same size would be 8 watts with poly. That means a poly panel will not give you as much output for any given size. Now, you might ask, well, Jeff, why in God's world would I choose less output when I can have more? The trade-off is money. You're going to spend way more money on a mono panel over a poly panel. So now, you know, some owners, for example, and boaters are saying, Jeff, I've got way more canvas or surface to mount solar panels than I need solar. 
In that case, what we end up doing is we end up putting poly. Think about in the countryside, you build ranchers. In the cities, you build high rises, right? So if I'm on a sailboater, for example, and he's a purist, he doesn't even have a bimini. He has a dodger and he takes it down and he has so little canvas. It's, he's trying to be as low profile as possible, but he wants as much solar panels as possible. We'll end up doing a mono solar panel on his dodger because we're working with so little space, right? And so that would be one of the differentiators when you're making a decision. You're like, I want a lot of solar, but I don't have the space for it. Well, then the way you do is you trade money. You could, get, you could do the same amount of surface area with poly, but you'd have less power. It's about, generally it's about 80% of poly is what a mono could give you. So if a mono gives you 100, the poly is gonna give you only 80% of that for the same amount of space. So here's another way, and I remember this trick question when I was a kid, um, grade five or something, and the teacher asked, I so wanted to be an engineer back then, you know, what's heavier, a ton of bricks or a ton of feathers? I was like, bricks, epic fail. It's a ton, a ton is a ton, doesn't matter. Now how much space does a ton of feathers take versus a ton of bricks, big difference. So a 100 watt poly panel is gonna be bigger than a 100 watt mono panel, right? Because if it's less efficient, you need more space to do the same amount of work. Here's an example of a boat, uh, trawlers where we're doing on the brow. I've done a lot of boats actually this last uh, summer where power boaters in behind, in between sort of the lower helm and the upper helm, they have this sort of brow and that's a place that nobody ever walks on, right? Because it's angled, it's not really safe. Um, and so we're covering those areas with solar panels. And they're not, notice, they're not perfectly, the, the, the best neutral position for a solar panel is obviously if you're gonna average, right? You're gonna put it basically parallel to the ground, right? So that the sun on average is gonna be moving like this over the horizon. Now, some people say, wouldn't it be better to move my solar panels as the sun moves around? I'm like, oh, absolutely. If you have endless labor and you can delegate that task, yes, absolutely. Now remember your boots, your boat's also moving like this at anchor, probably. So then you're constantly going like, now that is a full-time job. So the best way is to simply go for neutral, parallel to the water, right? And as the sun rises, you're not gonna have great. As the sun sets, not great. When it's gonna be overhead, it's gonna be better. And you're taking law of averages. This boat here, obviously, if the sun is behind, is not gonna be getting good solar output because it's angled away. Okay, but it's a compromise. Yes, question. Yeah, that's correct. The question for the gentleman was, good question. Yes, that solar panel install, if the sun's coming from the aft, look at that bimini. It's gonna provide chaining. You know what, honestly, if you want perfection, you can't be boating. There is no such thing as perfect boat, period. I don't care how much, it doesn't matter. I mean, you could be a billionaire. There's a few in this town and they're spending money like there's no tomorrow on boats and there's no such boat that says, yeah, that's a perfect boat. It's just another boat full of compromises. Every single one of our boats is a boat full of compromises. You're just, it doesn't matter, regardless of money, you're just, you can't have this or that. You're con and that's what makes it so interesting to everyone because what are you, choices are you gonna make with what you have and what you can do? Right? So um, here I'm gonna, there's a lot, remember these presentations are gonna, on our website on the media page. I'm gonna show the link a little bit later, but I'm just saying don't get fooled and think that the lowest price solar panel is the best value. It's like a car. The least expensive car is not the best car. The most expensive car is not the best car. Somewhere in middle is where you're gonna find the sweet spot for value what you pay and your ROI, right? So lowest is good in some ways, highest is good in some ways, but in the middle, 80% of the boaters we deal with are gonna find sort of like that normal alleyway. They're not gonna be driving a McLaren and they're not gonna be driving the least expensive car they found on Craigslist. They're finding a happy medium, okay? And those are things to consider about when you're getting solar panels. One of the things I wanna talk about this is generally you can tell a quality solar panel from a non-quality simply by looking at it. I remember one year we had really good solar panels in our booth and people were telling me, Jeff, you need to offer a budget panel. This is about six years ago. We brought the lowest cost panel you could buy. I'm like, they want it, let's give it to them. 
That year is the year that we sold more expensive solar panels than I've ever sold in my entire life. It was like a factor of five. It was through the roof because they saw the comparison. When you see them side by side, you're like, oh, that's what I get for this? I'm going to have that. So just do your homework. Look at what budget looks like and look at non-budget, and you'll be like, oh, OK. I, yeah, yeah, I get it. Just do your homework. Here's another example uh, on a sailboat aft cabin. Notice the solar panels are installed on canvas, and you can then remove the canvas. right? So I see that on some boaters. They're actually just easy. And I have owners that are storing the solar panels. Let's say they're in Mexico. right? Not everyone stays in the Pacific Northwest, although it's beautiful here. Big fan. And people are sailing offshore. They'll be literally putting the sail, their, their solar panels when they're leaving their boats there for maybe six months and they just want to clean everything, keep it as sort of empty as possible. They'll put their solar panels, remember the thickness, literally under their, their bed, their, their, the mattress. You can't feel it. It's un, other than the junction box, which is about, about a centimeter, not an inch. I'd say maybe over half an inch, a little bit over. But the rest of the solar panel is you can't feel it. I mean, it's less, it's about the thickness of a nickel, OK? So to recap what we talked about a little bit, you know, what, when you're thinking about solar, and I get this all the time about multiple questions, what are your goals with solar, right? Let's, I mean, we're getting solar, but why are we doing it? People say, I want solar. I'm like, our first question is, well, what are we trying to do, right? Because as an engineer, we've got to ask ourselves, what are we trying to solve? So one common one, and I get that because we deal with even boaters that have boats on mooring balls everywhere. Jeff, I have a boat. I'm not at the boat all the time. Um, but when I come on the weekends and it's on a mooring ball, I can't have a battery charger. But I want my batteries topped off. right? I want them to be flow charging. OK, we'll put a small, reasonably small, small solar array just to maintain the batteries. It's like being connected to shore power. I even owners that do that with boats on the hard in the wintertime in not a barn, but in a field where there's no shore power at all. It actually happens to a bunch of my clients that are in Washington State. They're bringing their boats back inland in the wintertime. They can't connect to shore power, but they don't want to remove the batteries. It's a hassle, but they want to maintain them. We'll do a solar array just so they can maintain their batteries in the wintertime. That way they don't have to take the batteries off. Because a battery that is unmaintained for a period of time, like eight months, will sulfate. And a battery that sulfate is a battery that will die prematurely. So if you don't like changing your battery banks too frequently, you want to have your batteries on some sort of charging regimen. The other one too, which I did on my boat, I said, OK, I want solar to offset everything I use every day on my boat. I don't ever want to worry about power again. I'm done. I want to sail when I can sail. I don't ever want to think about having to go back to shore power. I never want to run my engine on idle. I just want my fridge and my lights to run in the summer off solar, period. Right? So then you go, I want all my amp hour consumption just to be taken care of. One year, about five years ago, we lost our alternator, meaning it stopped outputting. It happened in late May. We did not change the alternator or repair it till the end of September. Didn't need it. Don't need an alternator. Don't I? We'd come up to marinas. People would say, do you want to pay extra for you know, a plug-in, I'm like, plug-in for, no, don't need it, I'm fine. They're like, oh, you don't want to recharge your batteries? Don't need to. We'd leave our boat at a destination marina and we'd leave it there for a week, two weeks, the fridge would be running, the food would stay cold, and we wouldn't even be plugged in. So every day the marina would have charged us something, no need to plug in. Now, I can't do that in the wintertime. In the wintertime I can maintain my batteries, but I can't run a fridge in this type of weather in January or December when it's sort of Noah's event happening outside. Uh, one last thing, I saw a question. The other thing too, offset refrigeration is really popular. And the last one is I want to stay longer at anchor. Jeff, I can't add more batteries on my boat. I don't want to. I know the implications that I have to change my charger, my alternator. I'm just looking at, can you find a way to give me another day in Anchorage? You know, like right now I'm staying two days. If I could stay a third day in the summer without running my engine, and then I leave the anchorage and I go to another destination, give me another day in anchor without changing my electrical system. That's a really common one. That's probably that and refrigeration are my two number one sort of requests that I get from boaters on what they're trying to do with solar. I had a question up front. So how many watts did you end up choosing to do what you said? The question is how many watts did I end up choosing? 
Patience, it will come. I've got a little formula. It will come, I'll tell you the formula. Yes, go ahead. Isn't the, uh, the last point, extend your time in Anchorage, isn't that basically the same as offsetting your daily usage? What, what's the distinction between the Yeah, the question is, well, Jeff, isn't offsetting your time at, extending your time at Anchorage and by an extra day or staying there indefinitely the same, it isn't. Because one is I'm actually, let's say I'm offsetting, every day I'm outputting everything I need for my day plus some. Right? If I'm using 100 amp hours a day, my solar array is giving me 100, 125. If I'm extending an extra day, every day I'm going in a deficit, but my deficit is not going down as slowly. So I might be doing 50 amp hours a day, and so the first day I'm not going to go as low as I used to go. Second day I'm going to go a little bit deeper, but not as low as I used to be. And the third day, then I'm going to go to where I used to be on the second day, but I'm offsetting. Right? So you're probably asking, well, Jeff, how the hell am I going to find out you know, what my daily amp hour is, is? Well, if you don't know, one way to know is having a battery monitor on board. right? That's a sort of knowing what your burn rate is. You know, When we plan for a retirement, one of the first questions someone's going to ask is, well, how much money do I need for retirement? They're going to, well, what's your burn rate? How much are you going to need per year? Are you going to need 20,000 a year? Are you going to need 100? Are you going to need 200? What's the number? And then you start, you got to know how much money you plan on spending when you retire. And so when you size battery banks, you size everything on a boat, you need to know what your daily amp hour consumption. Now, you can choose to ignore that number, but welcome to a world of pain. It's like retiring not knowing how much money you spend. Oh, you know, I saved X. Let's see what happens. Yeah, things are really not working out. You know, I'm thinking I'm going to become a greeter again. You know, I'm, I heard Walmart is hiring. Well, if you didn't know how much money you're spending, saving for retirement is only part of the equation. You gotta be able to foresee what your burn rate is. Otherwise, you're gonna be complaining about your batteries are dying prematurely, things are not working out, the fridge is dying, your food is tawing, we gotta go back to the dock, you know, all these other things. So a daily amp hour budget is essential to make all these decisions. Good news. Through experience, again, being invited to work on all of your boats, I can guess what your amp hour budget is. If you come to see me at the end of the class, you tell me what kind of boat you have, what you do. I've been on enough boats, I've been, thank you, been invited on enough boats to know what a daily amp hour budget is on average per person. You know, a little bit of experience pays off. So don't, no need to worry. Uh, here's another example on a catamaran. I was talking to one of our clients this, uh, this morning, uh, a 55 footer. We did something similar where we ended up doing sort of a stainless steel structure at the back to provide more coverage from the rain because they're going up north, you know, to Alaska. And we covered that extra coverage, right, with more solar panels. In this case, it's just stainless because it's not raining in certain parts of the world. But over here, if you're going up north in the summer, you have to be willing to have a little bit of rain and cloud. Alaska and northern British Columbia is not always sunny, even in the summertime. So here's the calculation on how to figure watts from amp hours. There is a long formula, and if you want to geek out, I can share it with you, but luckily there is a shorthand. And if you say, for example, <clears throat> I have a 100 watt solar panel, right? How many amp hours is that going to give me a day? A 100 watt solar panel is going to be 100 watts divided by four will give you 25 amp hours a day. And yes, there's a typo in there if you can pick it up. 100 times 20 is not 25. Yeah. So basically the math is if you buy a 100 watt solar panel, you're going to get 25 amp hours a day. Let's say it's a 400 watt solar panel. There's no such thing, but let's say it's a 400 watt solar array. How many amp hours a day will that produce? About 100 amp hours. You can go the other way around. You say, Jeff, I have a 75 amp hour budget on my boat. So that would be a very modest boat running a refrigerator, nothing fancy, some lights, a water pump, right? Sailboat, low 40s, high 30s. Very modest, no heaters, no TVs, no televisions, no running inverters, no hair dryers, like sort of a Luddite with a fridge and some lights and a water pump. And you say, Jeff, I want to run indefinitely at anchor in the summer. You're going to do 75 times 4 equals 300. You need a 300 water ray for your boat. That's it. You can imagine now the North Oven or the, this big catamaran that I did that's doing a 2,000 watt solar array. That means that they're burning 500 amp hours a day. 
right? Some boats draw a lot of power. That's why these huge catamarans that are sort of floating mansions have massive solar arrays because they have multiple fridges. They have lots of lights. They have inverters, right? Same thing with a big north oven. I mean, we were, we we're doing solar up to about 60, 70, you know, even on 70 footers, we're putting them up. They're trying to reduce their generator runtime. Now, that number is realistic. This is not a number that says, oh, this was on the best day. It's sort of like my financial planner told me that my returns were going to be double digit forever. You know, and I'm looking at my savings, my 401k, and I'm like, what the hell? This is not panned out. This is a realistic number in the Pacific Northwest in the summer from May to September. On some days, I get way better. I've seen the number up to about 2.7. 2.7, which is ridiculous. That means that is a hell of an output. So if I get, for example, an array on my boat, which is 450 watts, and I divide that by 2.7, let's call it three, but it's way better than three. That means that I got 150 amp hours of solar output a day. That is like, that's like being a professional hockey player or NFL player. It's like, let's make it rain. Drinks on the house, let's do it. You've got 150 amp hours of output and you're only burned 75? You got no problems. Run the inverter. Keep the TV on. Do whatever you want. It's the sun's giving us the energy. If you don't use it, it's just being wasted. That's what's so amazing about solar. And in case you're wondering why the hell would you do such a big array, is because I was worried about the shoulder season. Because we boat all year round, and I wanted my solar array to work from March till end of October. So I, I've got more capacity than I did in the summer. But it, literally, when we go out for Easter, we invite friends. We're six of us on a Catalina 36, and we're fine. And, that, and Easter is March, April, and we've got enough of a solar array to run that boat, and we have two refrigerators, because a lot of people. So we'll bring a sort of little cooler, and we're good. Here's an example of solar panels on a brow. Here's an example on a hard top. And here's a diagram, and we're close to wrapping up. Here's a diagram of what solar panels look to a dedicated controller or solar panels in series. That's when you have two solar panels where the voltage you're adding together, right? And you have one controller. So you can do that. You can, you can run them dedicated to controller, in series to a dedicated controller, or in parallel. I'm not going to go into the reasons why parallel I have a little bit of aversion to. It's generally to do with voltage drop and also what happens with amperage. Uh, but if you want a Coles Note version, go dedicated or go series. Okay, if you're curious on why, the whys take longer than the whats. We could be here all day if I told you all the whys. Don't mind asking or answering afterwards, but I don't want people running for the exits. So here's an example of solar panels in series versus solar panels in parallel. You notice in parallel, it's a little bit like series. Think about two golf cart batteries. Two golf cart batteries are six volts. You wire positive to negative to make a 12 volt. If you have two 12 volt batteries on your boat and you want a larger bank, you go positive to positive, negative to negative. Right? Parallel is positive to positive, negative to negative. Series is positive to negative. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the voltages add up, which is not a bad thing for series because it offsets voltage drop. Again, I, feel free to ask questions. Sometimes I'm, you know, could be in the back there for an hour. Just feel free, bring it on, no problem. I'll answer any question you want. There is a reason to my magic. Yes? Better than to have two smaller panels instead of one big one? Question, uh, is it better to have two small panels versus a big one? No, and the cost on a smaller panel is the larger the panel, the, le the less cost per watt is. So you would generally go with a bigger panel if you can. Yeah. There's reasons of redundancy why you would do single controllers, and there's also reasons of shading why you would do single controllers. Okay? Everything is easy until you do something. Everybody's easy to criticize anybody doing a sport. You put skates on, you play golf, you do anything, you're like, oh my God, way harder than I thought. Just, can I can trust you? If you're gonna do solar on your boat, research, 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 do it once, versus improvise, MacGyver, and then go, oh, I wish I knew that before. I wouldn't have done all those decisions. Do not go in the well of despair. I see people going down the well of despair too often. Right? Just getting busy and doing things don't always pan out. That's a little bit on the wiring of the solar panels. You'll see that they're basically, it, you can't see from the image, but it's actually double jacketed. When you buy solar wiring, it looks like a gauge 8, but it's actually a gauge 10. 
The jacket is double the thickness and it's made for outdoor rated. So it will not actually, in the sun and in the rain, you can't put indoor wiring outside. You just can't. The sun is a cruel, cruel thing. As we all know, there's a little bit of sun is good, too much sun is not a good thing. And these wiring are meant to be outside. We also end up hiding the wires in these uh, wire looms, right? So people don't like seeing wires. I'm very aesthetically driven. It's ex expensive to be aesthetically driven, costs always more to make things pretty, but it's a boat. If, you know, I tell people if it was in a boat, it'd be a barge. Barge can look ugly. You know, it doesn't matter if it's not pretty, it doesn't matter, but a boat, it's gotta look pretty, right? I mean, we generally all love our boats. I certainly do. So I care about how it looks on the outside. I don't want to look too functional. These are the connectors uh, that connect solar panels and you'll notice you can actually connect them or disconnect them, right? They're called MC4 connectors. And here's another image that's kind of neat. Um, those are how we get the wires inside the boat because it's one thing to have a solar array outside the boat. How do you get it inside the boat? And you do it with these cable entries, deck lines. And I'm just going to show this is the last slide and then we're going to go in the back. Just to recap, think about why you do solar, right? To think about the number that you're going to calculate. Think about if you're going to go flexible or rigid. Pros and cons, rigid is more expensive than flexible, but flexible will not affect the look of your boat and also the weight. And when you're doing the installation of the solar panels, make sure you use outdoor rated cabling. So with that, I'm going to close the presentation. And if anybody has further questions, I'll be in the back. Thank you everyone for being here. I really appreciate it. Questions in the back.